Hello and welcome to In Conversation. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about recent developments and ongoing activities here at the university. My guest today is Dr. Jane Close Connolly. Dr. Connolly is the President of Cal State Long Beach. Welcome Dr. Connolly and thank you for joining us on In Conversation. Oh, thanks Dave, I'm happy to be here. Well, you've been president now for about two and a half years as mm -hmm. we sit here today. You and I had a chance to sit down and talk about the campus and the university and some of your goals when you mm -hmm. first began. Mm -hmm. Now, as we look back over the past two and a half years, it seems like it went very rapidly. It does, uh, yes. Uh -huh. What are some of your perceptions now? Um, were there any surprises for you uh, along the way? And where do we stand as a university? Well, I'd start by saying I think we stand as a university by every public metric. Um, as a really strong organization. Our application rates have been rising every year for uh, graduate and undergraduate students. Um, our faculty have distinguished themselves uh, with books and papers and artistic uh, triumphs. Uh, our students, you know, for example, recently being named a, and from the Cole Conservatory Choir of the World, uh, pretty good. Uh, and our research uh, funding has steadily climbed um, and looks like this year again will be on a very, very solid course of improvement, and that's all faculty work writing grants. So on all those public measures, I think we're, um, we're, really, we're really in great shape, and I think our, our morale um, is good. Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of threats from the external world. Our loss of a student um, a year or so ago, Noemi Gonzalez, that was a real blow to the campus with, due to the uh, terrorism in, in Paris. But, Overall, I think we're good. Now there's some lots of obvious metrics that relate to the trajectory of state funding that I think are threatening and I look across the nation and see that there's some trouble ahead. Well, let's talk about that for a moment because everyone knows during the Great Recession we had a lot of difficulty here with funding and uh, that was true with all state institutions and right. all educational institutions. We managed to get through it. We're here, we're on an upward, we have been at least for the past several years on an upward trajectory in terms of budget. We've restored some of those earlier cuts, mm -hmm. but there is a sense that, and you just mentioned it, that we're not where we would like to be, mm -hmm. and there could be some trouble ahead. Mm -hmm. What about that? Well, as a system, you know, we really haven't fully recovered from um, the recession. Uh, we have really benefited from a uh, a plan from the governor and the, our uh, Department of Finance to increase um, allocation to the university system over the years, but what looks like a 4% increase is actually just the way the budget goes, you know, it's, that's 4% inc on instructional costs. There's a whole lot of other things that are going on in the system, and so it's really been less than a 2% increase that has been quickly gobbled up with healthcare increases, pensions, um, deferred maintenance, and so I don't I, I don't want to seem ungrateful because California has is a shining star compared to many many other states, but in fact we're falling behind, and the burden of uh, uh, higher education was shifted dramatically over to the California families and students right around the recession where our our tuition tripled. Uh, it's been frozen since then. But five years of frozen tuition with escalating costs and really only, you know, like hold your own kind of increases, we will be paying a price for that over the next few years unless we can get a different funding model from the state um, and also look for additional revenues from other um, sources. I think that's, that's an inevitable um, consequence and trying, as always, to, you know, protect access to the university by keeping tuition costs as low as they possibly can be. And we'll talk about philanthropy uh, a little bit later in the show, but mm -hmm. before we do that, we do want to talk about one constant that exists here at the university, and that is many people want to come and attend school or attend college here at uh, Cal State Long Beach. Yes. Uh -huh. In fact, we have uh, one of the highest numbers of applicants every year. It's actually gone up about 2% from the previous year and about 11% from two years ago in terms mm -hmm. of number of applications. In terms of raw numbers, we're talking about well over 90,000 right. students are applying. That means mm -hmm. uh, more than 60,000 freshman applications and around roughly 30,000 that are transfer students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are those numbers telling us about the popularity of Cal State Long Beach and about the need for higher education in general? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, it shows that um, compared to all other Cal States, at least, we have the highest application rate. So I think both our, our distinguished faculty, our variety, and really array of excellent programs, and our location. We have to really, um, you know, really give a, a shout out for being here in Long Beach in a city that has really uh, been transforming itself, too, to be a fabulous place to live. Uh, it, we really do stand as the most popular um, uh, higher ed institution in the Cal State system. I think it also shows that there's a huge appetite in um, California for uh, higher education. And, you know, we think of 17, 18 year olds, but that, it's really across the board of uh, people in professional careers who want to make a move or upgrade themselves. Um, and we have programs for all of, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, the sad thing is, of those numbers, we can take a little bit over 4,000 freshmen and somewhat probably 4,500 uh, transfer students. So that's leaving a ton, I mean tens of thousands of um, qualified students. In one, uh, two years ago, I asked, well, how many were not qualified who applied? It was only 12 percent. So most of the students applying have met at least our minimum requirements. So of course what's happened is all of our programs are overflowing and so we've been allowed to raise requirements to make a choice among individuals while keeping uh, committed and true to our uh, Long Beach College Promise commitments to favor our local, st our local area students. Um, but it really shows that California has not created enough seats in higher education. You know, we've started to track this at the system level and think, you know, if you look at all the system schools, and that's just our, our 23 campus system, we think that there's 20,000 people of that whole group that didn't find a spot, certainly in public uh, education, but we have some access to the privates too. So did, did they go out of state? Did they just put it off? Did they go to community college? I mean, all are possible and good scenarios, but I think it's a shame that we can't step up and provide the right number of seats for Californians. And as we talked about the 90,000, and as you mentioned, only about maybe 8,500 Eight, or right. so total mm -hmm. can be accepted in the university, right. that's really less than 10 percent. That's right. And when I say, you know, accepted, that means that's, we get, we get an enrollment cap. That's how many we will get state funding for. If we, if we got more state funding, we could fit in some more students. And so there's, um, you know, that there's a dynamic about state funding that uh, we could take another thousand students, perhaps, but that would mean funding from the state for another thousand. And as we talk about numbers, it's not just that we have this huge number of applicants. We also have the most, one of the most diverse campuses mm -hmm. in the system. I think uh, was it the Wall Street Journal, Times Higher Education College Rankings listed us in the top 10 in the West, mm -hmm. western part of the U.S., right. in terms of diversity. Yes, we have. And we sometimes think, well, that's, it's only eth ethnicity, and we certainly do have a lot of ethnic diversity. But uh, what's of particular concern when we're talking about costs, as we were just previously, is that it's, um, there's an array of economic diversity, too. So students from very low-income uh, families, uh, maybe who went to high schools that were not quite uh, up to par. So when they come, they need extra help, which makes it more expensive to uh, uh, educate them. They also may need other services, learning disability or um, uh, help with physical um, challenges, different abilities. So these are not, we, we get students who are not cheap to educate. Um, and uh, some are not ready exactly. They're great, they're smart, but they're not quite ready for college work even though they passed all the requirements. And so this diversity is a great strength of our campus and something that we must learn to nurture even better. Um, but it also puts a financial um, burden on the campus that is not felt by institutions that just take uh, students from affluent um, Families. Homogenous backgrounds. Homogenous backgrounds, yeah. Exactly. And, and to, in part, deal with this diversity that you've been talking about, you've developed a, a, a new campaign called Inclusive Excellence. Yes. Uh, what exactly is Inclusive mm -hmm. Excellence and what does it entail? Well, it's a national effort and we've taken it and tried to make it our own here at the beach. And what it really is um, aimed at is changing our philosophy toward mainly incoming students saying, can we meet you where you are? 
obviously many of you have beaten the odds by even getting here. Can we meet you where you are and move you forward? A real growth model and developing targeted services and educational um, experiences and pedagogies to really help every student. And our goal here is that we will no longer have an achievement gap. You know, we, we've just talked about our diversity and ethnicity and religion and social economic status. Uh, well, some of that translates into different graduation rates. And inclusive excellence is really aimed at getting rid of that opportunity gap, that achievement gap, and so everybody should be graduating at the same rate in the same, you know, roughly the same time period. That when you come here, we're able to accelerate you if you need that and support you, um, you know, in success um, with an array of services. So we've expanded it to include our faculty and our staff because my belief as a, a university leader is that if you set the environment to be positive, remove barriers, help motivate people, work on their strengths, then people will blossom. And so inclusive excellence to me means creating an environment that really maximizes every member of our community's success. And I know historically, uh, long before you arrived, there, there was some issues with uh, um, graduation rate. Yes. The number of people that were, the percentage of people that were actually graduating, mm -hmm. it was well and good to accept them into the university and to try to nurture them, but if they didn't finish, that was a problem. Mm -hmm. How are we doing in that area? Well, uh, due to um, the leadership of many f faculty and staff and, and um, certainly our recently uh, past uh, uh, provost, David Dow, we've moved from 39% uh, within six years uh, graduation rate to getting closer to 70% now. So that's an enormous in the last 10 years, but really probably more eight years. So we're really a leader and seeing that way across the nation that we, uh, for the kind of students, and when I say that, what I mean is economic diversity, ethnic diversity, a variety of different, uh, mainly people, um, uh, family educational attainment, um, number of languages that people speak, uh, we are really a leader across across the nation, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. And that's but that's the work of the faculty, the staff, and uh, certainly our academic division, who've really made that uh, reality. So we're on a, a good path. We've just been given a challenge, though, to uh, improve our four-year graduation rate from the governor. Our we our average time to be enrolled is five years. Uh, he wants that to get much closer to four years, and so that's another economic pressure. But it's certainly a good thing to do for students who. Um, are prepared to do that. Um, you know, we have to look at students who need to work 30 hours a week and can't take, you know, um, have planned to take a little bit longer, but we're in the midst of that campaign right now, as a matter of fact. A lot of challenges, but we're taking them on and we're moving forward. Yes. We do need to go to a break right now. Great. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about international education, community partnerships, and philanthropy. Stay with us. Should your company buy or sell, expand or not, relocate, or simply stay the same? If you'd like to examine past and present predictions, integrating finances and people, and make future predictions based on all that information, a career in economics is for you. You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to In Conversation. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Dr. Jane Close Connolly, the president of Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back, Thank Dr. You, Connolly. Dave. Thank you, Dave. All right, well, I promised at the tease that we would talk about uh, international education, mm -hmm. so let's begin with that. Mm -hmm. International education has been uh, something that we've been emphasizing more and more over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, this includes bringing students from foreign countries over to finish their degrees here, to, to um, increase their fluency in, Engl in the English language, and also to study abroad here. Mm -hmm. We also send our own students, our California native students, abroad for study abroad in mm -hmm. foreign countries. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the foreign students coming here. How do those students actually enhance the curriculum and the academic environment here? Well, we, uh, you're right, for the last two and a half years at least since I've been here, uh, 
we've really focused on this because I believe, and there's certainly research that would show, that <coughs> when our students, our native California students, U.S. students, get to interact with international students, that really improves their worldview. It makes them understand their own cultures better, certainly helps them understand the cultures of others in the world, and gives them a level of competence and confidence, uh, and often connections later in their work lives that uh, are really enhancing. So having uh, a certain number, our number of international students who are actually in programs here are, is relatively small. Uh, we have a much larger group that comes over for language training, but the combination, I think, gives us a, um, a feel of a more international um, university, and it's really not, it's, it's all about giving our students a chance, many of whom have never left California, as a matter of fact, a chance to interact with the world, mm -hmm. that's important. And I think it's important also that we point out, I had a conversation with uh, the Associate Vice President of International Education, Dr. G. Joshi, about this, that although we do bring in some international students to study here, they are not taking the seats of our native California students. Absolutely not. We take every funded California student. That leaves some room, and uh, we certainly get many, many applications from international students, but you know, we, we take a very small number. We may have, uh, thousand or so, uh, certainly under 2,000 students in degree programs, but they're not taking anybody's seat, and I think they're really enhancing the experience of the other students, and certainly the faculty. Uh, you know, we ha and we have students from everywhere, from, you know, probably 90 different countries, 92 countries, I think, as a matter of fact, and so this is a, a worldwide effort, and there might be only two or three, but um, it does give some of our students a chance to interact with the world. And it also provides having those international students, and as you mentioned, I think it's around 300 to 350 per year that mm -hmm. come in, so it's mm -hmm. around 1,100, 1,200 yeah. in mm -hmm. that ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, they also provide a financial advantage to the university. Tax pay California taxpayers are not subsidizing those international students. They're paying full fare. They're they paying. Come. They are paying full fare, and, and often they are as individuals and their families, and even more often their uh, governments are uh, subsidizing them. So it's a advantage certainly for them, but it's a small uh, financial advantage for us as our state funding has been stagnant. Um, it's given us a little bit of a buffer. And other universities have pursued this very aggressively, but we, as you say, take a few hundred a year. And as we talk about our own, we've been calling them native California yeah. students here, we have made it possible uh, for them to go overseas to have a study abroad experience. Yeah. How does that help those students and how does it uh, prepare them for the wider world that they're uh -huh. going to enter once yeah. they graduate. Well, um, I think we have almost 70 partnerships now uh, with universities across the globe. And, every, and we evaluate when they come back. And of course, we carefully choose the spots they go uh, and the faculties that with, with whom they interact. But we evaluate it. And overwhelmingly, students say, number one, this was transformational for me. I had no idea, you know. Uh, and we have now helped them. Um, in post-trip seminars, really develop an understanding of what did they learn when they were there. They learned to be resilient. They learned to be problem solving. They learned to appreciate difference. They learned to depend on each other and work as a team. Well, you look at those and match them up to what um, employers are asking for, and tra study abroad really helps those um, kind of teamwork skills, resilience skills, uh, problem solving skills. Uh, above and beyond, I got to know what it was like in Thailand, you know. So it's not just learning about another country or perfecting my skills in a language. It's really having to be, usually for most of them, more on my own and more dependent on my classmates than I've ever been before. And that seems to be a golden experience for our students. As far as funding, we all know that it's expensive to travel overseas. We've provided some funding resources for those students. What are those resources? So a collaboration between our College of Professional uh, and Continuing Education, which houses our international effort, our associated students, and the President's Office has um, combined to offer students up to about $500 to cover uh, fare. Now often in these countries, once you get there, it's actually pretty cheap. 
And uh, many countries, for example, in Asia, provide housing and food for the students when they get there. So the big hump is getting, them, um, is, is getting there. So we've, we've put in significant funding um, and significant work with these uh, partner universities to make it uh, financially possible. Some of the universities actually will hire our students if they'll come in the summertime before the semester begins and be English buddies for their students really help. They have a little, they call global cafes, and the students, if they go and will talk to the uh, international students in English, that will pay for their uh, semester of study in another, uh, in another country. So we've been working on many, many deals like that to really help the students afford it. Well, let's bring it back to the community here in the Long Beach or greater Long Beach area and the surrounding community. Mm -hmm. Community partnerships are also an important aspect of, of being um, a university of prominence here in this local area. We have the Long Beach College Promise mm -hmm. uh, community partnership, which involves the school district as well as the local community college and the university mm -hmm. to provide that seamless education. It's become a national model for it other has, urban yeah. areas. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific community partnership. We have others. Yeah, we um, do. You mentioned before we uh, came on the air that we've got one with Catalina. I believe yeah. it's a Catalina Conservancy. That's right. And we also have a, a Molina Healthcare and City Project. That's right. And. Um, you know, what? Uh, from my perspective, my strategy in choosing things to support, I mean, people go off and do their own things too, obviously, from every college and department. But I'm looking for projects that have, um, that are working on a local regional problem that really has worldwide implications. And so the Catalina Conservancy and Cal State Long Beach uh, partnership has that exactly. Catalina Island is a marker place for climate change. We have water problems, we have energy problems, we have um, rising sea level problems. And it's also, um, from the conservancy standpoint, an experiment in balancing um, ecological stewardship and economic development. So 12 of our departments, as a matter of fact, have entered into an agreement with the conservancy and um, are working across ecotourism, across monitoring um, plant life, uh, monitoring water, but also business, kinds of uh, issues for Avalon. And so it's just beginning, although we have some history uh, from, our, from the research side, and this is heavily research, but research the Conservancy needs to really um, you know, maintain this balance between economic and ecological um, stewardship. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. And the um, city uh, partnership with uh, great support from Molina Healthcare is really about entrepreneurship and helping those uh, you know, young and startup, maybe not young, but new startups, and um, really what, what is the science of entrepreneurship? What do we, how can we enable that kind of vibrant um, business and innovation and experimentation uh, uh, spirit as well as outcomes here in the city of Long Beach? And uh, two of our um, very distinguished economics and business professors are taking leadership in that. And, you know, we have partnerships with hospitals for uh, St. Mary's for trauma, um, recovery uh, with uh, Central Cha in our Latino community for health and prenatal health, postnatal health, fighting childhood obesity. So uh, I could name hundreds of them, um, uh, but it's a short show, so I'll stop now. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about philanthropy. We mentioned that earlier in the show, but that's an important aspect of being a prominent university as well. You yes. cannot survive strictly on state funding, as we know. We talked about that. So we need to encourage our, our community, our mm -hmm. businesses, our local corporations, and our extensive alumni network, which is almost 300,000 right. now. Right. Yeah. Um, we just finished the Declare campaign. We raised something approaching $240 million mm -hmm. through that mm -hmm. with uh, around approximately 56,000 new donors. Yeah. What about that campaign and uh, what are some of the hallmarks of it? Well, I think the, this is our first ever um, comprehensive fundraising campaign. Uh, so that's amazing. So we're really new at the effort. Uh, we have a tremendous upside with the almost 300,000 alums. Very few of them have been involved with us. When you think about per percentage, four or five, you know, certainly under 10 percent. There's a lot of people we still have to talk to. And it certainly is our hope that people will write us a check and, you know. But on the other hand, we, we, we need mentors. We need supporters politically. We need people who will offer internships. I mean, a university can be an anchor 
in a community. And it, it, its power, though, is when it connects with the community and the alums are one of our most important um, communities. I mean, they really are the evidence about whether or not we're successful. And you know, one of you asked earlier about surprises. Well, so some of the most pleasant surprises have been what our alums have accomplished uh, in their varying fields, from you know, from being teachers and nurses to being engineers to being you know, judges and uh, so uh, astronauts and you know, uh, so it, this is really a vital um, you know direction for us to go. And I'm very enthusiastic and optimistic about it because we have a great story to tell. I mean, we are working with our community uh, and, our, and our regional community, not just Long Beach um, City, but really the surrounding eight or nine uh, school districts and communities around here. This is, um, you know, this could be, transfer this should be transformational for our whole region, not just for our university. And I know that was one of the pillars of the campaign was transformation. Yes. Uh -huh. You talked just a moment ago about um, telling our story, mm -hmm. telling our good stories to the community, and that's another issue that uh, perhaps we haven't developed as well as we could have over the years, and that's the, the great research and the, and the great activity that goes on here mm -hmm. at the university. We don't always share that as much as we should with the larger community. That's true. And so we're now talking about public knowledge media training. That's right, yeah. And we just have a couple minutes, so yeah. what, what does that entail? Well, so um, it's completely voluntary, but I think this year we had about 25 or 30 um, of our faculty and some of the advanced graduate students actually come one Saturday after another Saturday and get advice and uh, practice and how to describe what they do in research to the general public because the general public I think wants to love us but certainly there's been enough media um, suggesting is it really worth it why should we be supporting this ivory tower well in fact we're no ivory tower we're out there really working on problems that affect you as a citizen, um, perhaps as an alum, but even if you're not an alum. So we want to arm our um, faculty and our graduate students with that special skill of talking to the general public, not just their peers in uh, refereed journals. And I'm so glad you mentioned their research because people think of us as, um, and we are, intensive teaching institution, but we are a significant generator of original research and that really helps the education of our students. You can't be teaching intensive if you're not bringing them the skills of research and the latest information. So there's no dichotomy there. There's no bright line between teaching and research here at Cal State Long Beach. On that note, we are going to have to close the program, but thank you for being here today. Well, it was my pleasure, and thanks for the chance to talk about Cal State Long Beach. Absolutely, and thank you for joining us for this edition of In Conversation. Join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.